Pac-12 play opens up for the Beavers with a trip to Colorado this weekend. But against Boise State, it was a tale of two halves. A slow start followed by a furious finish. suspects showed up and a new name joins the conversation as Beavers continue to build for the future. The head coach Gary Anderson joins us for the next half hour to break it all down. Beavers inside the huddle starts now. Well, Research Stadium's in the rearview mirror as the Beavs get set for a visit to Colorado this weekend to open up Pac-12 play. Along with the Fox, Steve Priest, I'm <laughs> Dusty Hera. As uh, we get the next half hour to break down what was Boise State and take a look at Colorado with Coach Gary Anderson joining us in a few uh, short minutes. But Steve, uh, I think where we should start is Boise State. Really a tale of two halves when you look at it. And Boise State coming out and going deep into that bag of tricks early on to maybe try and catch the young and inexperienced Beavs off guard on defensive side of the football. Well, they did. You know, when you, when you are young and inexperienced, what you do as a defensive coordinator is you make it pretty simple. You play soft zones. You play quarters. You play regular halves. And you're a little bit slow to force. You aren't playing quite as an aggressive situation. You count on adjustments to be made. When you're a, lung, a young team, you don't make those adjustments as quickly as you can. The Beavers missed some tackles. They just weren't quite ready. But the thing that bothered me, Dusty, was the speed of play issue. This Boise State team is a great test for the rest of the season in the Pac-12. The Beavers have to get on the field with their substitutions. They have to get off. They have to get down in their stance. They have to have the, the call in mind and be ready to play football. That cost them in that first half. So when we look at the difference between the first half and the second half, first half, Boise State gets over 400 yards of total <laughs> offense. And then in the second half, as the final two quarters, under 75 yards. What's the big change that, that you saw from the Beavers? Well, and also, remember, the first five times they had the ball in the second and half they don't even get a first down so that's remarkable but big change big changes where they went into a lot more man coverage and that's what they've done along the line with Idaho State the week before they bring up Tristan Dakut and Xavier Crawford at the corners or they bring the nickel back up and they play a man-to-man -man, and that cuts out all those combination patterns it takes away the easy throws it allows those people up to front to, to make the plays and the people up front started tackling better there's no question <laughs> about it a lot of missed tackles in the first half and now uh, on the other side of the football making his presence felt in this football game yet again was the former quarterback of this team Seth Collins and what a day that young man has had. It's safe to say that he is the most dynamic and explosive player on this offense so far. Well no question. Keep in mind he uh, led the team in receiving or excuse me in throwing and in rushing last year as a quarterback and now he's a leading uh, receiver. He had nine catches this week. But he makes plays. He also had a throwback to Garrett so that ended up in a pass interference. There was a big play uh, on that early touchdown drive. He can do everything. He's a playmaker. You need to get him the ball because he is competitive. See that catch? He just will make any play, and he's always in people's face. He, he'll go around you. He'll go over you. Um, it's something that becomes contagious, and I hope it's uh, a lot of people start catching it a little more because he is, with some other people, are, are the playmaker on this team. I think it, it goes a little bit uh, unsaid, but... I think it's hard for fans to understand how hard that transition is. I mean, going from quarterback to wide receiver, I mean, that, that is a skill set that this young man has that not a lot of college football players have across the country. Well, no, and and first of all, he's just talented. He's yeah. just flat out fast. He's big. He he is, uh, we've mentioned before, but his competitiveness make, means that he could play anything. This guy could go and play safety right, right now. He could play wide receiver. He likes to carry the ball. He didn't, he didn't gain a lot of yardage, but he will before the season's over with his flies sweeps. Now, Watch. you talk about a guy who scored on a fly sweep, a big touchdown run, and just as dynamic, Victor Bolden, and he is our damn good moment. Brought to you by Flat Tail Brewing, as this play right here, Steve, was quite the return uh, to the house. His big play yet again for Victor Bolden. Well, he's just like Seth. In fact, he's the experienced Seth. He knows what to do. He makes the best of every opportunity he gets. He understands the football game really well, and he's a team leader. That's one of the best things of all is when you get a guy who is a leader, the others will follow and the coaches can only do so much. As you know, sooner or later, it's got to come to the, the guys on the field. Well, let's check, check out this play a little bit deeper as this is uh, the play that you've chosen to break down today 
um, from the game last week. Well, I, I like this because, number one, special teams for Oregon State are playing really well now, right now in a lot of different things. But, you know, the idea with kickoffs is you try to, first of all, isolate. You try to kick it between the hash and the sideline. That tells these guys that they can corral the guy. But you're supposed to not, if you're going to have five guys over there, one, two, three, four, five, you better have some people back here too because it's just like a goal line defense. If you break one tackle and you've got your men in covering in man-to-man -man defense, it's a touchdown. And that's what this turns out. Watch this, this situation. They get a quick opening. You even get a, a guy blocking downfield and it's a great play. And, and you gotta have someone in the back who knows what to do. Look at that, he breaks it. Here's the, probably the best play of the day. Best block of the day right there is that official. And he, is there an angle? Could he have gotten there? I think if this guy gets there, he still can't stop Victor Bolden. As it is, the official takes him out, and Victor Bolden is dancing in the end zone. <laughs> you know what the best part about that? Victor Bolden, with the vision, he saw that the official's the guy that took out the uh, <laughs> took out the last line of defense, so he started high stepping down. What did Cruz? I like that. Well, again, you go back to playmakers. The Beavers going to win this year. They got to score more points, and they got to get it to the Victor Boldens, the Seth Collins, the Ryan Nalls, the playmakers. Now the playmakers are the guys that we knew about, but there was a fresh face that we didn't know about. Connor Blunt makes his presence felt at Oregon State, uh, and we will talk to Coach Gary Anderson about Connor and this upcoming trip to Colorado. Beavers Inside the Huddle rolls on. And welcome back into Beavers Inside the Huddle as we head down now to Corvallis to talk with the coach. Gary Anderson joining us live from Corvallis. Coach, thank you for taking the time for us this evening. How you doing? I'm doing good. You guys all right? Very much so, Coach. <laughs> hey, uh, Connor Blunt, uh, that was a surprise. Now, Daryl got hurt. So if you could tell us a little bit about the thought process and a little bit about Connor um, and then where, where it sits this week. I understand Daryl's back on the field and, and playing full speed, and he'll be the guy. Yeah, um, first of all, I don't think Daryl was injured. I know Daryl wasn't injured. Daryl had nagging scenarios and nagging situations that stopped him from being as good as Daryl could be, in my opinion. And, you know, we've talked about that long and hard for the, for, uh, the rest of this week, so we'll let that one go. Daryl will be the starting quarterback. Connor's the backup. Um, I felt at that point it was time to look at Connor for numerous reasons. Number one, obviously, I felt like he was ready to have his opportunity. Um, had no idea how that would go. You know, sometimes as a head coach, you make a call and you go with it. And uh, if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, then uh, you're an idiot. So that's that's part of the that's part of the drill. So I thought it worked out pretty well. He proved himself to be, you know, uh, ready for the moment, especially for his, how many reps that he's had. But I felt like we needed to get his legs involved in the game. Now they didn't show that much in the game. They weren't needed to. But the kid can really run. He's tough. Um, so he'll be the second team quarterback as we go through and Daryl Garrett and is our starter just like he was brought here to be. Now, Coach, I think the question that we have now is what's a guy got to do to get a scholarship down there at, <laughs> at the quarterback position, huh? A walk-on from Wisconsin, uh, you know, that is an impressive thing for, for a walk-on to go down and come out as, as, a, as a freshman. How much did you know about him coming from Wisconsin where uh, you came from just a, a year and a half ago? Well, quite a bit. You know, his, uh, his grandpa and I are very, very close. Uh, he's a great man and was great to me while I was there. Got to know Connor um, really from afar. And quite frankly, Vince Ginta, our recruiting coordinator there, now our recruiting coordinator here, was always in my ear about Connor. And uh, we watched him grow and develop and see how he'd gone through his time. And uh, so when the opportunity presented itself for us to get him in, involved in this program, uh, we jumped on it and said, absolutely, yes, we'd love to have him. Um, you know, we, uh, as he plays, as he moves through time here, I'm, I'm sure he'll be well taken care of, just like I told Grandpa when he uh, committed to come here. Connor will be well taken care of, just like we take care of all of our student athletes here, and he's in a good spot, and, uh, you know, so far, so good. But uh, it's been a great relationship, and uh, I'm glad he's here with us, and um, 
it was nice to see him to get on that field and perform and you know grandpa was able to watch him which was pretty cool now you you looked smart in in that chance he gave connor blunt he he proved himself in that first game you also looked real smart with the surprise onside kick there uh, against Boise State. What goes into the uh, to going for an onside kick a little bit earlier than conventional and kind of the thought process of, of when you go for it and maybe when you pull the reins back a little bit? Well, you know, we will be... Uh not a high risk team, I don't want to say that, but I think when you practice things and they practice well, Adley did a great job kicking that ball all week long. And, uh, you know, it's how much of a risk is that at the end of the day? It's, it's a risk. You're going to give them the ball basically at midfield, but, uh, you know, you kick the ball at the end zone, they get it on the 25, and they complete down the, field, the ball down the field, and they're at the 50 yard line anyway. So I guess you can look at it, but we're not going to coach scared. Uh, he executed it extremely well. He's a baseball player. He's a tough-minded kid. He's a competitor. Uh, he could handle the moments. He showed he could handle the moments before, and uh, he executed it perfectly. So we do want to be aggressive on special teams when the opportunity presents itself, but it's important to understand that the kid that is in the moment that has to produce is way more important than any coach drawing it up on a board. It's way more important than some scenario where you say it's some great play that you've seen work for other people. It's the young man that's in the moment and uh, he did a great job of executing in that situation because of who he is as a young man and gave him a chance to make that play. Coach, almost uh, another onside kick but a trick onside. Late in the game he almost pulled it off again. Yeah, you know, we needed to get that done, and uh, we were in that situation. I think it's something every week we'll try to show a little different wrinkle um, to get us in a position to recover those, and we kick it with the expectations to recover it and try to take advantage of the other team. It's not just something we practice the same onside kick every single week and, you know, uh, say a quick prayer that we're going to get it. We do it with the expectations that we are going to recover that kick. Uh, that one was executed again very well. Their young man fell on it and, and made the recovery. So just like on offense, defense, and special teams, we are in a position where we have to make some special plays. And uh, we made a few of those. I was proud of our special teams. We won the special teams battle in that game. Victor was fantastic. The kickoff return team was awesome. They allowed us to have a fast start on the offensive side of the football. Uh, you know, lots always talked about how you start, what you do. Well, you know, one side of the ball didn't start so well. The other side of the ball started extremely well. The special Special teams started extremely well, so in my mind, that's a football team that was ready to play. Special teams was very special, Coach. Um, there was another chance you had to, to take advantage of things. You went for a fourth down uh, near the end of the third quarter, big situation just inside the 50, chose to go for it instead of punt. Uh, again, just the same attitude, you're going for the win. Well, yeah, you, you cross the 50 in a game and you're in a scenario where it's a, whether it's a tight football game or how we got ourselves in the position at halftime where it wasn't such a tight football game. You know, you, you need to be able to go for some fourth downs. Um, I think it's an attitude. I think it's a kid's belief. Every one of them, no. Calculated risk, yes. But there's times when you need to go for it. Um, you know, it was a critical one we obviously didn't get in this last game. We've had a critical one in the Minnesota game that we didn't get either. Um, we've converted on some as we move through time, but we've got to have the attitude that we're going to get those, keep the drive alive. And we're looking for seven points when we get into uh, the other side of the field. Uh, we were not successful nearly enough. We were eight times we crossed the mid field stripe were very close to crossing it we were successful three times Boise did it seven uh, and they were successful six so there you have the game yeah. all right we're just getting underway with coach Gary Anderson Boise State in the rearview mirror let's look forward to the Pac-12 opener against the Colorado Buffaloes who are already 1-0 in league play it was a dog fight last year though between these two teams 17-14 was the final we continue with coach Anderson and inside the huddle Montez going to the end zone for Bobo, and he caught it, and it's a touchdown, Colorado. There's that over the middle throw, and they may not get him. Devin Ross racing. Brucott to the corner for Carey, and intercepted. Colorado got it. Witherspoon. Oregon football is now 2-2. Two and two. Welcome back in to Beavers Inside the Huddles. We roll on with Coach Anderson down 
in Corvallis and coach as Colorado Buffalo's team picks up their first conference win of the season last weekend in Eugene uh, a, a team that has been steadily improving do you when you look at this Colorado program do you see similarities with, with the stamp that Mike McIntyre and the youth that he's kind of developed his players with the process that you guys are implementing down in Corvallis and in rebuilding and building your own program well, I have great respect for Coach Mack. He's done a great job, and there is absolutely similarities. I mean, we're in a very similar spot to where they were uh, a few years ago, and it's been a big boy fight for those kids. Uh, Coach Mack, it's been tough. It's been a grind. You know, he's had, uh, uh, this is year four, and uh, it's, been, it's been very difficult, and we've talked and communicated. Uh, we go back to our days when I was at Utah State. He was at San Jose State. We both had very talented teams in those days, and so, you know, he gets it he understands it he's going to build a team that's right as long as he's given the opportunity to build a team that's right and I think that's imperative that's what he's done and uh, those kids are in a great spot um, it's special for me to see a group of kids start to have success after they've gone through so much and I don't know one one young man on that team but I know that they've worked extremely hard I know what they've gone through um, with teams that uh, I've been a part of in the past and we're going through a lot of those things right now so similarities yes and uh, you know you are where you are and you sit where you're at for a reason you have to continue to keep battling and fighting every single day and not listen to any of the outside noise you have to listen to yourself and stick with what you believe in. Um, I believe good things will come and Colorado's experiencing some of that right now. Coach, they aren't winning these games uh, with, with luck or, or with uh, any bells and whistles here. 523 yards a game on offense, 42 points. He's using a two-quarterback system by necessity. He's got talented people all over the field on offense. Talk about that offense and what you have to do specifically. Is anything like Boise State? What, what do we look for this week? Well, the first time, they have, from my understanding, they have not been stopped in the first drive yet. So they go out and they score, and they're it's either seven to seven or seven to nothing um, right out of the gate. So this is a team that uh, executes very well. A lot of that has to do with it's it's a little bit like the option. You know, it's hard to get to simulate what they do within a scout team. They play with pace. They have multiple formations. They move people around. They run the quarterback a lot. Uh, all those scenarios are, are difficult to be able to prepare for. They have unbalanced formations. Um, you know, they they do some really really good things on the offense side of the ball but way past their scheme is the kids that they have within the scheme on offense they have quality wideouts they have a couple very quality backs obviously a couple quality quarterbacks that have proven they can both play within the offense and they have an old established offensive line where they'll rotate a number of guys through defensively I think they've done a great job they shifted gears on the scheme uh, about a, well, a year and a half ago or so whatever it may have been um, and they are they're talented on the defensive side of the ball so they, they're deep I think they're in my opinion, there's three NFL corners running around out there. Not a lot of teams have those kids uh, that are that talented at that spot, but uh, it's not just one. There's one that's very, very talented, and uh, I'm sure he'll go very high in the draft, but to my opinion, there's two other kids that can really get it done over there and some other pieces to the puzzle. I forget uh, number 44's name. I apologize for not knowing his name, but a heck of a football player. And there's, So that they're, they're good, and in all three phases, they've done some good things. Had a little knock with an injury on a kicker, so we'll see where that sits. Uh, Coach, as the offensive line has been trying to find its stride, there's a lot of shuffling going on down there in practices leading up to this week. Reports coming out uh, about Sean Harlow, who, who said earlier in the uh, training camp that he would be redshirting in all likelihood. Has his status changed, and should be fans expect to see Sean Harlow on the offensive line uh, this week or in the coming weeks? Yeah, Sean's going to play, and um, great credit to the kid. You know, he wants to be part of this now, and he came in and communicated with Coach Woods and communicated with myself that uh, he was felt like he could, and that's really what it was during training camp and up to this point. It was, are you 100% able to go out and play and be ready and get cleared? Um, he got cleared, and he went through a week or so of practice, and he wants to be involved in this Pac-12 schedule this year. He's very excited about it. Um, Good communication with a young man who knows the scenario that we're in and really the only kids that know it are the ones that are in that room. A lot's been talked about, a lot's been written about that whole scenario and that situation, but nobody that's not in that room really knows um, exactly what those kids have gone through. And 
Sean Harlow wants to do his part his senior year to come back and be part of that offensive line that's gone through so much and it's important to him that he himself and his guys perform to the best of their ability so you know hats off to him tremendous teammate that's why he's a captain I hope he has a tremendous year and he'll start at left tackle coach Gary Anderson coach thank you for the time good luck and safe travels in Colorado appreciate it guys go beeves go beeves coach all right, we still roll on here as Beavers inside the huddle. We got our keys to a win in Colorado. More Beaver football talk than you know what to do with Steve Priest as hashtag Beavers football. Hey, guess what? Spoiler alert, I'm going to be on that show tomorrow night. On Friday night, Saturdays, it's Steve Corey representing the Beavs on CSN Game Day. Talking Beavs on Wednesday nights and then us with Coach Gary Anderson every Thursday, 8.30. Time now for our Northwest Honda dealers keys to the game. I start with uh, you got to average more than four and a half yards per carry. Beavs as a team this year are at 3.9, but those are a little inflated due to the Idaho State game. Get to four and a half yards per carry, you're going to be all right. Two, keep Colorado's quarterbacks between the tackles, whether that means on the run or passing the football. You can keep those guys in the pocket. You're going to have a lot more success defensively. And then three, score more than 30 points. How about this one? The last uh, time Colorado failed to score 30 points in one a game was against Oregon State, a 17-14 game. Yeah. So if the Beavs get to get to 30, they're going to be in good shape. Well, the Colorado's averaging 42. Remember that one. And Coach Anderson mentioned that if this Colorado team scored every time they've had the ball the first time they had it. So good. I say start fast. Offense, <laughs> defense, special teams. Defense particularly. I'd just soon see the defense go out and play it tough man-to-man -to -man coverage in the first. Win the turnover battle. Beavs win the turnover battle. They win the game 95% of the time. That's a big issue to Oregon State, and they have to do it. And get the ball to your playmakers. There are a number of them. I mean, through three or four different uh, setups with Paul Lucas and those different groups, plus the guys we've talked about today in Collins and, and uh, Victor Bolden and Nall, uh, Gerritsen, there are guys out there that can score points. They need to get them the ball so they can score them. Well, this starts the run of Pac-12 games for uh, the Oregon State Beavers. You get Colorado this week on the road, but then you come back home for Cal, Utah. You go to Washington, and the Washington State comes back in in Pac-12 play to round out the month of October. So Pac-12 plays underway. Beavs in Colorado. Hey, safe, safe travels to you as you head over to oh, Boulder. Yeah.